So one of the first things, first things FASB and its predecessors, if you remember, I said that there were, said that there were a standard setting bodies, but that the FASB took, SB took as the major standard setting along, uh, has been around for decades longer than either of its predecessors. One of the things they did was create the conceptual framework. And the conceptual framework currently com is comprised of eight accounting concepts. Um, and there still is a little bit of, updating that's going on, the, de the defining liabilities and equity, especially with, s with uh, certain current hybrids that companies are coming up with that isn't quite like equity, isn't quite like debt, that's still under scrutiny and potential evolution. But for the most part, these concepts are, are, are laid out and are set in stone. Um, they set the ground rules for the formulation of standards. So basically, these concepts outline what is the goal of a new standard or the update of an existing standard. So right? what are we trying to accomplish? What qualities of information should these standards entail in order to meet that goal? Right? What are the common themes that should be applied in standards? So all of these things are laid out. And this, again, is why we have the why of all our standards. If you went through intro to financial accounting and you thought, wow, this just seems like a bunch of arbitrary rules, very boring, um, then perhaps you, know, you didn't get this sort of idea of the why because there's always a reason. And believe me, understanding something will stick in your head and make a lot more sense. It'll actually stay in your brain and your neural pathways rather than just being stored in your short-term memory and then dumped out as you move on to the next class, which is why I am so keen on my students understanding the why and not memorizing a bunch of random rules. It also makes it more, makes it more interesting. I mean, one of the reasons I don't tax law is because tax law is comprised of, comprised of a bunch of men in Congress, Arbor, little pieces of legislation to win the favor of their constituents. And so it, sometimes tax law becomes extremely arbitrary and nonsensical. Whereas when we talk about financial accounting, we are always building within a framework that is based on a conceptual framework laid out by the FASB. Um, now, these questions are going to form a lot of the rest of our discussion. The first one was, well, why? What is the goal? That is our accounting objective, the overriding accounting objective. And that's our goal line here. What is the objective of, our, of, of any standard that we create, of any rule that you find in a textbook on financial accounting? What we're trying to do is assist in the efficient functioning of the economies and the efficient allocation of resources and capital markets. I already talked about this a bit. That is what financial reporting is meant to do. Allow investors and creditors to make wise decisions. Here we have, again, the investment and the creditors. Get used to those guys. They're our audience. We got to know them. Useful in assessing future cash flows, right? So we need to know something about the cash flows of the company. Now, Interestingly, we're going to learn things about the cash flows by not just looking at the statement of cash flows, which you might think would be the first item to look for assessing future cash flows, but actually there's a superior statement, and that's the income statement. The income statement provides net income, and net income is a better predictor of future cash flow than cash flow. Sorry, that's supposed to be a dollar sign. Which seems ironic. Like ironic. Like I get a better of future future cash from statement of income than I do from a statement of cash flows. Yeah, you do. It's actually do. It's actually been searched. Right. Finally, we get information about the enterprise's resources. These are, of course, assets. Claims on resources. These are liabilities and changes in those resources. These are going to be net income, which eventually filters into retained earnings, which is equity. So you can already start to see, this is the reason why we have the statements, the financial statements that we do.
it's not just, oh, hey, it sounds good that we should have some income going on and that should be a statement. No, it appeals back to what are we trying to accomplish with financial reporting. So understand the objective, the overall objective, as well as the three sub objectives that obtain this overall objective. So next we look at, well, what information should we put out there? Remember, we are speaking to the audience that is external to the company. But what makes information useful to those external investors? Well, the SEC says that there's two, not the SEC, sorry, the FASB maintains that there are two primary characteristics that are important to external investors. One is relevance, the other is faithful representation. Let's look at each of them in turn. Now, relevance implies information that is capable of making a difference in a decision. Right? We want to give investors information that can allow them to decide whether or not they'll invest, whether or not a company may go bankrupt. And what are the characteristics of relevant information? Well, it has predictive value. We should be able to take today's numbers and get some sense of what may happen in the future, do some extrapolation analysis and figure that out. Confirmatory value. Information, information should either confirm or Correct, correct, impressions. Material big one. is a big one, right? But then you really need to focus some effort into to understand because again, it's one of those things that's gonna come up again and again, not just in this course, but in other courses you take in accounting. Um, materiality refers to whether there is a certain threshold of relevance that is created. Would the information make a difference in the decisions made by use, users of accounting information? So if an item is material, it will make a difference. If an item is immaterial, then it may not make a difference in how someone decides to invest their money. So when we're identifying transactions to record, we have to say, well, is this transaction material? Will it make a difference in an investor or creditor's decision to invest their money. When an item is considered immaterial, then it can be recorded outside of GAAP, but it must be reported. Now, so remember, it's not that we can just ignore it. We've identified it as something we need to record, but do we have to follow the strict lines of GAAP? Maybe not if it's immaterial. So if a transaction be recorded could be recorded according to GAAP or in a more expedient or easier way that is not GAAP and the user would still make the same decision, then the item is immaterial, right? Um, it doesn't need to be a large quantitative dollar value. It could be a small dollar value um, if that small dollar value would alter some key outcome for the, for the company. So for example, if that small boost to revenue that seems immaterial because it's just say oh, $100,000 of the net income, net income billions, right? 100,000 sounds like a lot to us, but when we're talking about billions, eh, you don't mind shorting yourself maybe $100,000. Still, still $100,000 would allow, would allow a company to report positive rather than negative income if that $100,000 would allow them to meet an earnings per share forecast that is issued by equity analysts, which is very important to companies, then it becomes material. So it's essential to assess materiality when you're on an audit. And in fact, a lot of auditors, when they approach the audit, will set a threshold of materiality. Like, are they gonna really push against management about the way they've recorded something if it hasn't met this threshold of materiality that was set by the audit team. Faithful representation is the second primary characteristic and it just implies that there's a congruence between reported information and the economic events that the reported information represents. In order for something to be faithfully representative, it must have three sub uh, traits. Complete it has to be fully explained. Quantitatively and qualitatively, it has to be neutral or free from bias. 
Um, and it also has to be free from error. Now, there's something to be said about free from error. A lot of times our estimates are going to have some inherent variance and that's okay because we have to make some estimates that are a little messy. Um, but as long as we're not omitting any significant information in making those estimates, as long as that's not buying us, biasing us in some way, then we're all right. Um, you know, faithful representation suggests that congruence between the economic events we're reporting and what's contained in the report. Um, and that requires also an equal appeal to both well, to both what we call the letter of law and the spirit. Of law. And if you th if you're not familiar with this concept, right, um, you know, letter of the law means you might be following the law in, in a very exact way way, but you're skirting what the spirit or the substance of that law was meant to achieve. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I often give is that my BMI classifies as me classifies me as morbidly obese by the letter of the law of BMI. It takes my height, it takes my weight, and it says, "Oh man, this guy has health problems." Um, I'm not obese. I'm slightly overweight. I'm not obese, right? I'm just a big guy. I have a lot of muscle mass, and BMI does not take that into consideration. So it, I might be in violation of the letter of the BMI law, but BMI is classifying me, you know, the spirit of BMI is to track people who are obese, but um, that's not really happening with the whole BMI. So we have a, a distinction there. To go to a, a more um, accounting uh, consideration of, of spirit versus letter, um, there was a flavor of the month form of financing. It was called Mandatorily Redeemable Preferred Stock, or shorthanded acronym MRPS. I know the business world is full of these, get used to it. It became popular in the first decade of the 21st century. In fact, it was what I wrote my dissertation on in order to obtain my PhD. Unfortunately, the loophole of MRPS was closed. Uh, about a year after I finished my degree, and so my dissertation was rendered not publishable or relevant to academic standards because it was no longer an issue. But essentially, MRPS is preferred stock that is issued to large investor groups, so exchange-traded funds, other corporations, pension funds. And this type of preferred stock pays mandatory dividends so the company has to pay the has to pay the dividends to investor groups that purchase it purchase it. it has to be bought back at a future date by the company by the company so not only does it end, but any dollar that i invest so if i buy a share of preferred stock an mrps at a thousand dollars then the company has to pay me back a thousand dollars in the future right However, owners of MRPS do not possess the ability to force a company into bankruptcy, unlike a bondholder. Where am I going with this? Well, here we have something that's called preferred stock, right? So we have some of the characteristics of equity, but we also have some of the characteristics of a liability. Because this thing really kind of sounds like both if you're familiar with bonds and stock, right? Um, on the equity side, there are uh, it, there is a uh, no risk of bankruptcy, so it checks that off under the equity side. It seems more like a liability though, in that it must be bought back. It also becomes a little bit more liability oriented, although there are forms of equity that have mandatorily uh, mandatory dividends, um, the dividend payments are, are more like a, uh, almost like an interest payment. So there's this obligation to buy back in the future. And so this is sort of the principle of a bond and there are required dividends from the payment over time. However, if 
if they miss buyback or miss dividend payments, they can't force the company into bankruptcy. And that is definitely more along the lines of equity rather than rather than ability. So why is this a big deal? Well, this is what we call one of those hybrid instruments. If the hybrid instrument then is classified, the reason why companies came up with this really weird thing is that it had all the hallmarks of a liability, but they wouldn't have to classify it as a liability. So when they were reporting on their balance sheet, they would have a list of liabilities, they would have some equity, and they would put and drop the MRPS down in equity, even though it had these hallmark characteristics of a bond. Well, they argued, hey, it's called preferred stock and there's no risk of bankruptcy, so it's not really a liability. Well, we're gonna report it as equity. However, eventually, as I said, the SEC stepped in and said, no, 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 you can't do this. It was one of the rare moments the SEC took action before the FASB did and said, you cannot any longer list this as equity, right? This is an important distinction, just so you know. Um, Companies are judged by ratio analysis, so the fewer liabilities they report, the better off they look in terms of creditworthiness. Um, this is also, uh, financial ratios can play a part in certain bond covenants, such that if the bond covenant is triggered by the company, then the bondholder can insist on certain rights and privileges, like a higher interest rate being paid, or accelerated payments so that they can protect their own interests. So when we classify this into the balance sheet is an extremely important thing, even though you might say, eh, they can just move it. Um, that's not really the case. These are legally binding documents. So as soon as the SEC stepped in and said, nope, you can't put it here, you know what companies did, they actually just dropped it in the middle, the middle, and it's not an official reporting section, but, but it's called Disney. Ability and equity. So eventually the FASB had to come in and say, no, this isn't okay either. Basically, it depends on how you want to redeem this instrument. If it's going to be redeemed in cash, then it has to be a liability. If it's going to be redeemed in shares of the company's stock, then it can be equity, right? So anyway, this is a form versus substance the companies were, were going by form. They said, hey, look, it's called preferred stock. There's no bank risk of bankruptcy. We're gonna drop it in the equity file. But it didn't have the substance of equity. It had this obligated buyback. It basically buying back redeeming principle at the end of a certain time period. Dividends that were more like an interest payment than actual dividends, which are optional, right? So anyway, just an example of substance over form.